welcome. How are y'all doing? No Jamie tonight. Jamie wasn't feeling it. I told her we had the uh, Dagon liturgy tonight, Dagon Vespers, and she said she didn't feel like it. So she's not she's not doing her Dagon service like she's supposed to. So it's just old me. It's little old me. But many of you are used to that. We're alone together. Hashtag alone together. Hash. This is my wings are sprouting. And I'm going to fly off. In terms of the virtues of my soul, I will fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh, my. I'll fly away. If you would hit like and share. Are you ready for Lovecraft? I don't know how we haven't covered Lovecraft yet, but we haven't somehow. And here we are. Uh, I read a book about Lovecraft many years ago, and it kind of got into some of the esoteric elements and the Necronomicon and all that kind of stuff, which I do not believe is real. I actually did read the so-called Necronomicon that came out from, was it Simon & Schuster put out a so-called Necronomicon from a few years ago? Um, I just think that's that's obviously a made-up thing, right? There is no real book from the Mad Arab called the Necronomicon that invokes the old ones. But it was kind of funny because it had like all of these guttural invocations. Like a Thuvan Thuvan throat whatever that is. Remember when uh, like really extreme Spurgs were getting into Thuvan throat singing? (laughs) Like five years ago. What? By the way, thank you. We already got Super Chats rolling in. You guys are really generous. Appreciate that. Did you know Dagon is in the Bible? Of course you knew that. Because we have an educated, beautiful, fast boy audience. And two fast girls. There's literally two girls in the audience. And if Jamie's not here, there's one. So basically, I'm just joking. Uh, Rachel and Melissa, <laughs> that's about the extent, right? No, I said, isn't that the extent of the girls in the audience? So there's three three females, Rachel, Jamie, and Melissa. And if Jamie's gone, then uh, it's, it's a sausage festival. <laughs> Get it? Get it? <laughs> Where is everybody? It's Monday night. What is there to talk about if it's not Dagon and love crap? By the way, did you know he was a literal incel? Uh, Literally. Well, actually, he did eventually have a lover. He did have the coitus. He He did eventually catch coitus. But this was a weird story where his lover woman uh, had to had to basically make him do it pretty crazy stuff right so I didn't really know a lot of his background I learned a little bit when I read a book about his it was a book about his esoteric stuff basically but I knew he was basically an incel man and if, if you take a look at the fella well, you can probably see why. I mean, he's... Uh, homely isn't even enough to describe this man. But part of the reason he has that look, right? That... There was a rumor that he had a little bit of... A little bit of keeping it in the family in his background. And this might have then influenced his pattern of creeper secrets in a family 
That's an emerging pattern we will see in his stories. Now, not every movie tonight is a directly Lovecraft-based story. Because there's not actually that many of those. There's a few, but I wanted to focus tonight on the heavily Lovecraft-influenced movies. So a couple of the movies are actual Lovecraft movies. The late, uh, early 2000s, Dagon, that was actually pretty fun. Uh, it's pretty gross, but it's also fun. And the thing with Lovecraft is that he's mainly known for being the ultimate horror influence. So whether it's Stefan King or whether it's uh, John Carpenter, I mean, you can't escape the influence of Lovecraft in horror. So I thought it would be fun to do a deep dive into the esoterics and the meanings and the symbols because there's quite a bit there and I am not a huge Lovecraft fan so that's why it's, sometimes it's interesting to do the things that you're not used to and even though I'm not a big Lovecraft fan I can go on a journey with you guys together we will do our own catabasis to find and invoke the old one the old one I'm just kidding. the Cthulhuanic deities from the beyond so, we have a selection of movies. I did want to talk about Dagon first, because Dagon, of course, is a biblical thing. And I was just rereading the book of Judges, as you guys might have known. I mentioned it, I think, a few weeks ago. Not only do we have multiple references to the triad in Judges, we also have this wild story of Samson. And if you remember, Samson is in there fighting against the Philistines and they worship a Dagon. And Dagon is this fish god. Did you know that? And that will be apparent in a lot of these. So he, he's a, you know, he comes from New England, so he's by the sea and there's a lot of this fish god stuff going on, right? Uh, but if you've never seen the movie Dagon, I recommend it. It's it's bizarre. So maybe I can pull up the original trailer here. Again, remember there's not that many film adaptations of his films, right? So there's Dagon, which is two when is this? Nineteen two thousand two thousand two or three. And this one is pretty good. This is the story I have read. So I've read one story. This one I did. Stuart Gordon, this is classic, like, cornball, you know, full moon video. is Stuart Gordon type stuff. So he's done a few of these Lovecraft adaptations. But you have the shipwreck. You have the cult. And the one good thing about this story that I did like is that in no right it's it's not very long it's a, it's an easy read uh, you know fifteen minutes or something and basically this guy who's a morphine addict is writing of his last experience on this island right with this she fish cult basically well i mean in the in the movie they make it a she fish cult but uh the weird part was that he's baptized in black goo i thought that was weird right so that i wasn't expecting in this story because in the black you have this uh you know goo substance when he is shipwrecked and he arrives on the landmass and he's covered in, in black goo so is this like the is this the first instance of black goo in literature is it supposed to be oil um you have a recurring theme in horror films right of the semi-sentient black goo from x-files to a million other uh, other horror movies jamie and i did a whole podcast on this kind of stuff uh but in dagon the story these elements are present and eventually the island of the dead which is said to have this monolith that is covered in hieroglyphics 
The first reference that's interesting in the story is to Milton. And if you've seen the shows that we've done, Bayes Lit Analyzer, right? It's like there's the Paradise Lost is constantly referenced and Lovecraft references it because it says, I- I've, I've come to Satan's kingdom. And he says, like, I feel like Satan climbing into or down the mountain to his kingdom or something like this, right? So you get these Paradise Lost references and you there's this giant monolith, which is covered with the hieroglyphics of the fish people. Uh, and then he ends up, of course, a victim of this cult. Uh, fun story. And the movie is a pretty good adaptation to that. So let's get into the movie because we're here to mainly talk about movies. So Dagon is, as I said, uh, 2001. If you remember, you have the all-seeing eye, which is the, whatever company made this intentionally chose the all-seeing eye. So there is this fascination, I think, with a lot of directors and, and companies and writers to see Lovecraft as this occult figure. But in Lovecraft's own life, he apparently adopted atheism at one point. So I don't know, yes, Milton's Paradise Lost. So I don't know if uh, he died as an atheist, but I do always find it strange, which we'll get to when we get to the Dunwich Horror, is the references to weird Kabbalistic stuff. So we'll see that here in a minute, but... um, I can't even read my old notes. So this one is a story about greed in part. We're talking about the film here, the Stuart Gordon film. But it is uh, an esoteric order of the of Dagon, right? There's the esoteric order of Dagon. It's a human sacrifice cult, and it's a fish god. And why do they worship the fish god? Well, let's look at Dagon and see what the what the ocean gave us, right? What does the ocean give as a kind of deity? Because I think that will be part of the key. And I wonder why why do why do the do the Philistines worship Dagon? So I have a classic summary here I'll read really quick from the Fawcett's Bible Dictionary which is a old school classic theology dictionary Bible dictionary it says that Dagon it derives from dog and fish so fish dog fish dog this sounds like a cart like a weird cartoon network cartoon right fish dog the male god to which outer goddess corresponds and is mentioned in Second Maccabees. I didn't. I didn't actually recall, recall that this was in Second Maccabees. The body and fish tail worshipped at Heropolis and Ascalon, which I think that's the Philistine, right? Philistines of Ascalon. The mermaid is actually derived from Dagon. And by the way, in the movie, this chick is a mermaid, right? Doesn't she actually looks like at one point the logo of? Starbucks, right? Because y'all know the logo of Starbucks is, you know, that's the fish goddess, you know, getting frisky, right? Y'all know that, right? But she's got fish tentacle legs. Dagon is derived also from this Phoenician idol. She, uh, she answers to the Greek. Aphrodite, the divine principle supposed to produce the seeds of all the living things from the moisture. So perhaps then that's why this is Logospermaticos, right? Uh, it, she corresponds to the Logospermaticos. She's the matrix of the womb, so to speak, the goddess. Twice a year, the water is brought from distant places and poured into a chasm. Blah, blah, blah. But it says Dago, D- Dago, not Dago, not a Dago pimp. Uh, Dagon was the rational god of the Philistines. National god, excuse me. It's a very tiny text. His temples were at Gaza and Ashdod, according to uh, 1 Samuel, which if you remember in the book of Samuel, Dagon is the idol that's worshipped by the Philistines, and when they steal the ark, Dagon keeps falling over in front of the ark, which shows the deference to the true god of Israel, right? The Temple of Dagon, which Samson uh, eventually destroys, is probably a Turkish kiosk, probably resembled a Turkish kiosk, 
a spacious hall with a roof uh, and a front upper four columns, blah, blah, blah. The Philistines and chief men celebrated this uh, sacrificial meal there whilst people assembled above and upon this balustrated roof. The half man, half fish form of Dagon found at, I can't read that word, something, some weird city, was natural to the maritime coast of its dwellers. They seamlessly joined the human form to the divine beast that perishes to symbolize nature's vivifying power through water. So basically, Dagon's the water god, right? So it's association with water. Maybe also some primitive kind of form of uh, Neptune or something like that. I mean, I'm just speculating. He does kind of look like Neptune in some of these drawings of Dagon because he looks like he doesn't have the trident, but he's got like a weird hat and, uh, you know, he's got fish parts. And by the way, this comes up in this movie, right? Because when the poor seduced soul here ends up on this cult island, uh, he thinks he's going to get lucky. And, you know, this girl's not too bad looking. But she's got fish parts. So that's pretty much a deal breaker. Right? And I know some of y'all nasty people that you wouldn't even care. But that's because you're nasty. But I think for most of us rational human beings, that's a deal breaker. Uh, so no fish parts. And uh, she's not having it though. Right? She's like... I still want you. You are still with me. And if you... I don't want to spoil the movie, but I'm going to spoil the movie. She ends up getting him into the cult. So basically, he becomes, uh, you know, kind of half fish man. Now, another element to this, which is just typical in biblical symbology and theology, is the likening of human beings to beasts. And in scripture, the likening to a beast is what happens as a result of living in a wicked idolatrous way right you become more and more beastly and in part i think that's partly the motivation for why the gods of the nations that are worshipped in scripture or in ancient egypt or whatever like they're they're hybrids right they're half human half they're dog-headed they're pig-headed they're whatever and that animal blending has to do symbolically with number one it represents the demonic obviously because unclean animals in the old testament represent the demonic every unclean bird uh, in the book of revelation for example is a reference to the unclean animals in leviticus which in revelation the unclean birds are called demons so we know that's a key indicator of how to understand these birds and these these creeping things and and the ones that feed on carcasses right those kinds of animals but there's another element too, which is the intention of uh, blending and mixing improper things, right? So this idea of a fish-headed man or a you know a fish-bootied woman—that's gross. But it's also intentionally blending the things that are not supposed to be blended, right? There are boundaries, delineations between not just species but different types of beings right think about jude when jude castigates the angels for going after the females citing genesis 6 this is going beyond the natural delineations of that kind of being mixing kinds that shouldn't be mixed so it's a mark of a lot of paganism and not everything but a lot of pagan idolatry and this kind of uh you know, ancient world religion stuff that you'll see the blending of man and beast. Just again, think of Egyptian uh, symbology and Egyptian hieroglyphics and the steelies of Egypt, this kind of stuff. That's making this point. By the way, thank you guys for those super, super chats. Much appreciated. We're uh, down on Dagon tonight. Did y'all go to the Dagon liturgy this last weekend? Some of y'all did because we got a few we got a few damn heathens and pagans in the audience. Y'all was out there at the da the Dagon liturgy. Y'all was out there at the damn Dagon liturgy, which you boy uh, Deontrius over there over there at the Dagon liturgy, as Theo Vaughn might say. Well, you shouldn't have been going to that church. That's the wrong church. I can tell you that. 
last point that I wanted to mention about oh by the way if you don't know the when Samson pulls down the pillars and it collapses that is a type of Christ pulling down the pillars of Hades if you didn't know that in the typology of the descent and harrowing of Hades and Samson is in many ways a type of Christ by the way if you didn't know that now let's see what else is going on here the the last section I want to read about Dagon and that's neat is that it says the Hindus worshipped I can't read this it looks like Fishna <laughs> Krishna <laughs> instead of Krishna it's Fishna I can't read it. Actually, it looks like it says Fishna, but it's not. So the Hindu equivalent of Dagon is Fishna instead of Krishna. The Babylonian o Otakon. In the door doorway of Sennacherib's palace, there is a base relief with representations of Dagon with the body of a fish. But under the fish's head is a man's head. And the tail is women's feet joined to the tail. So... He kind of sounds like he might have <clears throat> both parts. Does that make sense when I do my scowl over the reading glasses? Y'all know what I mean. Both parts? Interesting. In 1 Samuel 4, when you see the falling over of Dagon's head, uh, it says excuse me, the falling over Dagon is head falling off. The cutting off of Dagon's head and hands when it falls before Jehovah's Ark and is therefore lying on the threshold prefigures the ultimate cutting off of all idols mentioned in the great day of Jehovah in Isaiah 2, uh, 11 to 22. Beth Dagon in Judah is another and another in Asher according to Joshua 15:41 and Joshua 19:27 show the wide extension of the worship of Dagon his temple in Philistia fastened up fastened up I can't read that Saul's head that doesn't make any sense in his temple oh in Saul not Saul the apostle not Paul. In his temple, the Philistines fastened up. Oh, <clears throat> when Saul killed himself and the Philistines took Saul's body, they cut his head off and they stuck his head in 1 Chronicles 10 <clears throat> in the temple of Dagon. That's right, because they were uh, honoring Dagon, giving them the, the head of Saul. <clears throat> And remember, uh, David cuts off Goliath's head. Goliath is also a Philistine. So the removing of a head is not just it's a sort of a barbaric, you know, war thing. It's symbolic. And you'll find it symbolic not just in scripture or in battle in ancient history. It's symbolic in literature, too. There's a lot of places in literature where people have where the removal of the head is symbolic of the removing of the dynasty like the next person the, the 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 king the death of the king and in one of the movies tonight we'll see that with the death of the king so i hope you enjoyed the foray foray into the <clears throat> actual history of dagon <clears throat> but i think that his turning to atheism is probably why he focused so heavily on all of these biblical deities i i don't think you i think he had some kind of protest loose protestant connection but he was not, uh, to my knowledge, really like he, he was opposed to Catholic, like he was anti Catholic. I knew that in uh, anti, uh, you know, other religions, we'll say. <clears throat> and he had some, um, you know, he made fun of people. Let's put it that way. He made fun of people in other communities, so to speak if you know what I'm trying to say over here on YouTube. Can you figure it out? So that's the character. Of, uh, now, again, but did he get into the occult and that kind of stuff later? I don't know. I'm not a Lovecraft scholar. But uh, I didn't... I mean, maybe he was interested in the occult stuff because he does put some weird stuff in 
books that do seem to kind of hint at the occult, right? Thank you for those. Uh, I, do I, I actually look kind of like I looked in high school. So you're like, what's up with this long hair? Well, I put a picture up explaining that I told my stylist in the trailer today, give me the Manson. And I got it. Gibble, gobble, gibble, gobble. So you got a Manson haircut free of charge. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you appreciate it and you are good stewards of my hair. Because you don't always get this with your content creators. So that's Dagon. It's uh, fun, but it's also gross and mucky. I mean, there's a lot of dang... I mean, you basically, the movie is like a chum... You're inside of a chum bucket for the whole of a movie. I mean, it's gross like that, right? Um, they have psalms. They do a liturgy to Dagon. You think I was joking. No, no, no. There's a Dagon liturgy, <laughs> okay? So, uh, you know, if you go into the Dagon church, it's time to become Orthodox. They... <clears throat> We find out that this nerd, of course, is chosen by this priestess of the Dagon cult, right? And she's the one that engineered everything to bring him there. And there was this, uh, the story is that there was a, a famine at one point, I think, in this uh, island town or whatever. And many, many years ago, they made a pact with the god of the sea, the devil of the sea. And so if he gave them wealth then they would worship Dagon and they meet initially in an old Dagonism and they faithfully keep the traditional Dagonite liturgy they don't update to the Dagon Novus Ordo they do the traditional Dagon liturgy faithfully and they chant to the god of the ocean Ia, Ia, Ia Andale, andale, mama, ia, ia, uh oh. <laughs> they over there singing Nelly. Okay. But that is what they chant. Uh, and they have to do human sacrifice initially to make this pact to get paid with that ocean ocean gold, dude. They're getting paid. They're getting paid. What's that tough lesson? Well,. When you make a pact with Dagon, you might get a little bling for a little while. But then when you die, you become basically a fish zombie in the service of Dagon. So was it worth, you know, what's a, what's up rapper? Gold all over my chain, gold all over my watch. Don't believe me, just watch, right? Trinidad James basically made a deal with Dagon. Trinidad James over there worshiping Dagon. It doesn't pay to worship. That's but the, the message is don't worship Dagon, right? We own that Samson Bible over here. Why you got long hair? Because I'm like Samson. That's why. I got that Samson look. And if you cut it off. I'll be a wuss. But if I have long hair, it's over, son. Get me in that octagon with this long hair and see who lasts 10 seconds in the octagon when I got my long hair. Right? Dagon all over my watch. Don't believe me, just watch. Thank you for those super chats. You guys are being generous tonight. Do we have 400 people that like love craft? Well, it looks like it. Welcome. Hit like and share. Move on. Move on, they say. Move on. Move, said Moby. Move, said Moby to the carnivore. There's a vegan coming through. What's up next? Well, uh, we're going to go through this one quick because we've done it before, but it's such a heavy Lovecraft influence movie. We have to do it. And it's also uh, something that I overlooked in my earlier days of movie watching. Because when it came out, I didn't really get it. I was like, what is, this is just weird. And I wasn't super into John Carpenter yet. And now I do like John Carpenter. And so when I found out, oh yeah, this is actually super duper Lovecraft, right? Lovecraft has a story called At the Mountains of Madness, right? 
Well, that's why the third of the Apocalypse trilogy is called In the Mouth of Madness. Now, if you've never seen In the Mouth of Madness, uh, I recommend it. It is, I'm trying to work on my uhs because it's it annoys me. I don't listen to my talks when I do them, but I hear myself say uh, and I start getting on my own nerves and I'm about to fire myself. And then you'll get a different altar in my head taken over. And who knows what you're going to get, right? In the mouth of madness. Anyway, but this is a lot of fun. And who could not enjoy John Carpenter movies nowadays, right? Of course. So we got Sam Neill playing. Uh, well, I won't say who he's playing. He's playing an author. He's basically Steve King, okay? So that's the who this character is. The preeminent Dean Koontz, uh, right? Dean Coombs, <laughs> Dean Koontz or Dean Coombs. So there's a, there's one for the memers to make. You want to make a meme? Make the Dean Coombs. Uh, but basically, Sam Neill is John Carpenter. I mean, Sam Neill is Dean Koontz and Steve King, and he's an author. And she's like trying to figure out, okay, I want to write my next, uh, you know, big horror novel that's going to revolutionize everything and everybody. And his name is, he goes under the pseudonym Sutter Kane, right? So who's Sutter Kane? Oh, it's the pseudonym that he writes under. And it's not a real person, we think, right? And so this book comes out and, by the way, uh, I think it's one of Charlton Heston's last roles, if I remember. Well, you've got Charlton Heston there, Sutter Kane. Dagon is made of fish. Dagon is made of fish people. You damn dirty fish, right? Chuck Kane. I mean, uh, Chuck Heston. Y'all being generous tonight. Appreciate that. Chuck Heston, one of his last roles, I think, is the literary agent. And he's like, hey, uh, you know, we're excited about your new book. This one's going to be uh a killer but things start getting weird and they get weirder and weirder and weirder and i like this movie the more that i watch it the first time i watched it i didn't like it right i'm sorry you're right you're right i, I had to I had to refresh myself because i this one i haven't watched in a little while sutter kane is the author and uh Sam Neill is recruited to investigate what happened to him because he's missing. So he's on the trail of it. And I'm sure everybody, you all know, right? Um, it's him, right? So he, he doesn't remember it because he's become the vehicle for basically, you know, Cthulhu over there to write his his uh, masterpiece. And yes, I've seen Nefarious. This, this has a Nefarious style element to it because if you've seen the movie, the movie that all the evangelicals are uh, gaga over, the Glenn Beck movie, Nefarious. There is a bit of a Sutter Kane element to it because the guy uh, who's the psychiatrist becomes, well, inadvertently the demon wants him to be the vehicle for his message to end the world, the dark gospel it's called in, in the movie. Um, in this... We find out that Sam Neill is on the trail, as we said, of Sutter Kane, which it is. It ultimately, we find out it's him. But he's realizing that he's part of a story that's writing him. And there's this demonic, you know, from beyond entity that's using him uh, as we progress in the story. And he, you know, cuts up the book covers to find a map. And then the hobos start going crazy. John Carpenter and his hobo demons. Right, they're everywhere. You can't watch a John Carpenter movie without the hobo demons. By the way, Glenn Beck put a hobo demon in his nefarious movie. <laughs> so, so uh, hobo uh, David Lynch, hobo demons. You just can't get away from them, right? They're winos. They're on box cars, and they're chopping heads off. And they got uh, two pupils, right? Like this hobo demon here. So things that people just start going nuts, basically, right? They're losing it. And it turns out that Sam Neill, who has an alter identity as Sutter Kane, 
is actually initiating the apocalypse. That's why it's part of the apocalypse trilogy of John Carpenter. But he's initiating it because he's written this book, which is just too crazy. It's just too evil. It's just too much. It's got too much coons in it. Dean put too much coons in it is what I'm trying to say. And it's just going to end the world, right? We, we like hobo demons over. We, Jamie and I are always talking about hobo demons. And when you get around hobos, a lot of them, unfortunately, do, they do seem to have demons. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not a hobo hater. You hate no hobos. Why you hate no hobos? I don't hate hobos. Just stating facts, man. The, by the way, the double pupils, if you're wondering, that signifies double personality, right? Alternate. So basically, humans are getting possessed on a mask. I'm starting to think maybe this book was written. Maybe maybe we are in Sutter Kane's novel. I mean, I mean, the world is turning into Sutter Kane's novel, basically. Because people are going, everybody's a hobo demon. Now, I went, we were out in the pub in public at the zoo, and Jamie and I were talking about the whole public looks like a hobo demon. So maybe this is real. Maybe that we're living in the days of Sutter Canes. Um, but it's like the ring is okay. What we got going there? So basically, you know, in the ring, if you're Naomi Watts's two front teeth and you watch the movie, uh, then it's you're done for, right? You're cursed. Well, if you read the book, you're cursed, and it's basically bringing about the apocalypse. The novel is thus the portal for the old ones to enter. And so there's, I think, also, yeah, there's kind of a Crowleyan nod here because Crowley supposedly channeled the Book of the Law and it was from Iowas and it was going to be the final word of the end of the Aeon and all this nonsense, right? But in this story, it's his trilogy. It's it's the House of Leaves uh, trilogy or, or maybe it's more than three books. It's a billion dollar horror franchise. So it's basically, there's a lot of coons in this Dean coons, if you know what I mean. Billion dollar franchise. More and more people are uh, dissociating when they read the book. So it's more than just a book. It's an actual like demonic talisman, it turns out. More and more people are reading it. Uh, bookstores are selling. People are busting into. Now we know this is not the end of the world, the way the world will really end, because nobody reads books. Okay, so you're not going to have an apocalypse of people reading a book because people don't read, because people have turned into hobo slow boys, hobo slow boy, hobo slaba, right? To use the Russian for hobo slow boy, hobo slaba. The book, not only is it being, uh, is it basically a, a, an inadvertent incantation to invoke the old ones through to this world, it's the old ones are coming through when you read the book through the minds of the people that read the book and they get double pupils because they're now possessed, you see. And it's creating a demon hive mind. And Jamie said this is like basically... Uh, what if Goosebumps were the end of the world? <laughs> so basically, yeah. So, uh, did you read your Goosebumps books? Did you know? Did you know that basically a Goosebump would end the world? That's what's going on here. We do see, by the way, a uh, square and compass that is flashed in one of the scenes. I think when he's besieged by hobo demons, Sam Neill, that is. Well, uh, when he's on the trail after the city basically goes ape shit crazy, he decides he's going to have to go tra track down uh, Sutter Kane to figure out what's going on. Uh, the agency, literary agency, sends him, and he goes to Hobbs Inn because this is the last place that he was seen, which is some weird place in New Hampshire. Again, uh, more nods I think to Lovecraft, right? Because New England, right? And Steve Steve King, he's up there in. Derry, New England. Stephen King, he's, uh-oh, watch out. There's greasers and slow boys. And there's, uh, you know, Chuck Taylors and a red balloon, right? That's like every Stephen King. And Jamie and I were talking about the perfect Stephen King movie would be a greaser slow boy. That is a killer. But he's also a savior. 
That's how Stephen King would do it. Why? So there's a new movie coming out, Boogeyman, right? How many slow boys are going to be in the Stephen King Boogeyman? <laughs> Is the Boogeyman a slow boy? But he's a lovable slow boy who secretly has an alternate personality inside of him that will also save the day. You know, some kind of baloney like this. Anyway, eventually, as he's investigating at Hobbs End, the world, the, the insane people are now the majority. There's an odd St. Anthony quote, uh, right, that is referenced. Everybody knows the St. Anthony meme. It's gone on the internet now for five, six, seven years now, right? When the, which is because, it, and I think it's actually referenced in this movie. So this movie was memeing that meme before anybody else, which is pretty wild. Is it is this one right? Yep. Y'all can y'all see that? No, you can't see that. Did I have the chick up that whole time or did y'all not see her? Was she visible? Did y'all see the day going girl the whole or is it just me on my face the whole time? Did I forget to change it? Anyway, there is the Saint Anthony meme, right? A time is coming when people go mad, and when they see somebody who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you are mad because you're not like us. And that's actually reference. That's what's going on in this movie. Basically, everybody's going nuts. And we find out that <clears throat> he thinks he's found Sutter Kane at this horrible city where it's just getting worse and worse and worse. People are basically breaking out with hives and the zombie virus and, you know, the coof. And... There is an Orthodox church. Yes. Isn't that crazy? It's getting crazier. So here's, uh, you know, Sam Neill doing his investigating at this place. Now check this out. What does he see? Look at that. A giant. And I looked up this actual church. And I can't remember if it's a Uniate or Orthodox. But... Isn't it odd that they chose that? Because it's just so played out, you know, in movies that always choose Roman Catholic churches. But for whatever reason, they chose an Orthodox church <clears throat> in this. And the guy that plays, uh, what's his name? He's he's the Paul Atreides' dad, right? He is who we think is the author. But then it turns out, no, actually, he's an alternate identity in the head of Sam Neill. Okay, does that make sense? And he's uh, written the book, and there you see the portal. The book is the portal for the entities to come into the world. So, you know, Steve King and Dean Koontz and R.L. Stein. They're the magicians that write the magic ritual, the book, that then invokes and brings the entities into this world. That's the point of this movie. And then, it, of course, it ends with uh, Sam Neill in the Mental Institute. And any time in a movie you go into a mental institute, you have to cover the place in crosses, right? You can't have any exposed surface, surface space that is not completely covered in crosses, that's just that's just how it goes in the mental instance. And sometimes you just even put the marker to your skin and <laughs> cover yourself in crosses. I mean, classic staples of Hollywood mental institutes. And it's all there, baby. So, <clears throat> long story short, by the way, do you notice that the children are decaying, which is a sign of the youth are now being corrupted. Corrupted. Uh, he becomes the channel for the entity that tells him what to write. Uh, and we find out this is a new Bible. And now it will be a new evil Bible for the future. There's also some sort of confession to the devil. Um... Eventually, we find out the Sutter Cain books are more popular than the Bible. There's a reference to, I think, therefore you are. So the entity thinks, therefore you are, right? 
not I think therefore I am Descartes and not I am that I am of God, but I think therefore you are. The page is the portal. The abyss is opened. That is the point of this here, right? Because the entities, they want to get into this world, right? It just sucks over the abyss, basically. It's just shitty, man. Trust me, right? And so you want to get over here because we got beaches. We got Charlton Heston. We got, uh, what do we got? We got Sam Neill. We got ice cream we got a lot of things that the abyss doesn't have so they want to get back over here uh but as you guys know i'm sure you've all seen it the whole world basically dissociates and has a schizophrenic break which is, seems to be what tavistock wants to create by the way uh, yeah sam neill really likes these kind of like lose your mind movies and yeah, event horizon yeah exactly so the movie was able to uh capture the even the non-readers because a lot of people won't read the book and so in the mouth of madness gets made into a movie and we see the fifth wall broken the fourth wall broken when sam neill is crazy going crazy in the movie watching himself in the movie that we're watching so it's like, whoa, dude, Inception, right? Meta Inception. He's watching his own movie. And then Kane reveals that Trent is one of the characters. And then we're supposed to think, aha, you, dear watcher, reader, are also a character. You see. So a lot of interesting overlaps and uh, playing with a lot of different ideas of meta narratives and all that. Uh, it, it is a genuinely creepy movie in parts if you go watch it. I mean, it's corny in certain areas, but I did. I remember seeing this movie in the theater and it was a lot of fun. And it, it genuinely is still kind of creepy, I think. Elements of it are. There's a lot of stuff that's corny. I mean, when he's running down that hallway, because there's a hallway to the abyss, by the way, if you didn't know. <laughs> Uh, and then the the goo the goo goblins and and sea creatures are chasing him. That part is pretty corny. It's actually kind of funny, but yes, in the mouth of madness, one hundred percent a Lovecraft inspired adventure. Let's move on to the next one. Now, this one I won't spend too much time on because there's not a whole lot in it, uh, but it was a fun movie, and it's a recent adaptation of. Lovecraftian things and that is Sacrifice from 2021 and uh, this is a really well made independent indie horror movie and it has all of the indie horror twists but it's still good and they use a really interesting where's my notes here we go filter uh, the way it was I think it's shot in you know some kind of like high super high def and it, I sometimes I don't like that look it doesn't look like a movie but this one it actually adds some kind of weird aesthetic to the story and there's a lot of neon and a lot of aurora borealis green that uh you know make for a very aesthetically pleasing horror experience so there you see uh baby cthulhu baby's first cthulhu uh jamie said because this guy we find out if you've not seen sacrifice i'll give you a rundown and i'll break down a little bit of the symbolism this uh this old boy here has nordic blood but he's grown up in the city he's a city boy he doesn't know the old ways right and he's got this uh, gal she's pregnant newly pregnant and his mom who lives in the old nordic country has passed away and so he's like, all right, well, let's go check out the house. I've inherited the house. Let's go see it before we sell it. And let's make a little cash, right? And she's like, uh, okay, but as long as we can go back to being a city city people. So one element this of this movie that's a little annoying is the, uh, yeah, this is Cthulhu, is the, 
movies love to do this thing where the city people are sophisticated and civilized and the country people are, you know, barbaric, uh, cultish, and slow boys, basically. Right? But everybody in the city is virtuous and sophisticated and smart and intellectual. And it, okay, this is kind of true, but guess what? The people in the city suck and the people in the country suck. Oh, what if I throw that one at you? Throw you a curveball. Now, I'm not saying everybody in the country sucks, but not everybody in the city sucks. But it is true, and I can take you out here in the countryside of Tennessee and show you some some funky people. And you don't want to spend time with those funky people. And that's true. It does exist. But I can take you into the city. I'm going to show you some funky people too. Some dang fentanyl zombie. Do you want a fentanyl zombie in the city or do you want a meth zombie in the country? Which one you want? What do you like? Who's more virtuous amongst the zombie class? <laughs> right? And that's the, them's the facts. But in movies, they love to portray it like the city people are just so virtuous. And everybody in the country is a rube and gross. And we're all basically, you know, we got teeth like, uh, you know, Lovecraft over here, right? We got, we got a, a dang, keeping it in the family jawline, if you know what I mean. That's that. That's that, you know, banjo jawline. Right? You got a deliverance jawline right there. By the way, there's some nasty people in the city, too. So, You prefer the lake people? Yeah, you could have city people, or you could have, you could have the, lake, the lake. Guess what? In the country, lake people are their own kind of thing. Okay, because there's lakes around here, and they're called lake rats. So in the countryside, you got rednecks. There's mountain people. They're all different types of weirdos. But there's the the lake people too, and they're there. They, the lake people could be a Lovecraft entity. <laughs> I could take you down to the lake and show you some lake people. Anyway, this movie, by the way, it has it's like a. It's like a B version of Midsommar, but it actually is a pretty good movie. It's not bad. Uh, Sacrifice, that is, right? So let's get back to that. He's going back to his childhood home, and Jamie makes a great point that he's not going there to... He's going there to spawn, like the, like the sea creatures do, right? The sea creatures go back to their origins to spawn. And he doesn't know it, but that's kind of what's going on here. And he doesn't know, as you guys can imagine, as is often the case with... Human sacrifice cult movies. He's the cult sacrifice, of course. So, spoiler alert. But you could probably figure that out from the name, right? But there's some great misdirection in the movie because we don't know if the sacrifice is going to be him, his wife, or the child. And most of the time, I think we think, oh, they're going to sacrifice his child. No, no, no. It's a female priestess cult that is dedicated to some sort of Cthulhuanic deity in the water. And we don't, I don't think we ever see that thing. We just see a green glow, which is pretty cool. I like that. We don't see this thing that requires human sacrifice, but it's a green glow, right? And we have, of course, all the standard omens. And then we get just straight up cult activities, right? I mean, it's at this point, you know, he should have this should have been red flags okay when you when everybody in your village is you know invoking entities and doing robed baptisms that are in no way canonical <laughs> this is the red flags but of course we can't have a horror movie without ignoring red flags and every red flag gets ignored even to the point where the cult utilizes a local indigenous Nordic woman to seduce him and put him into mind control, right? So he basically goes into total mind control with this cult. They put him in the spell of 
wanting to fit into his local tribe. So there's kind of a, a bit of a left tint to this movie, right? Because the wife keeps saying, oh, we need to go back to the city. We need to go back to the city. And everybody in his uh, village is like, no, no, stay here. And you will find community, stability, heritage, etc. And we, we almost get the impression that this gal is a mermaid. I mean, I don't think it, exp it says that, but she she kind of just comes at the lady. She seduces him. And eventually he's like, no, I believe this stuff. He's a convert, dude. He repents and converts to Dagon. Oh, Cthulhu, excuse me. Uh, we're going to do Underwater. Yes, that, that was my next up movie with, with Bella. Because Bella has to end up fighting Dane Cthulhu here in a minute. Anyway, long story short, it's another human sacrifice movie. And uh, I already covered Dagon. Um, I love those movies where the whole town is a cult. Those are some of my favorites. And that's, that's what you get here. I do recommend it. It is a fun trip. Bloodlines of the Cthulhu Nadi. Exactly. That's what this is about. That's his bloodline. Again, we have this family has a deep dark secret narrative and spoiler alert the wife who tries to eventually escape we do have the black goo baptism also in this by the way the wife tries to escape no turns out she is also a convert to the cult and the hubby is the sacrifice interesting the city versus the country motif the aurora we know that all by the way there's also some connection with the aurora borealis and the green glow uh because the aurora aurora borealis is glowing green and then when he when he's dunked and baptized into the cult uh he sinks down and sort of has this beatific vision of the green light whatever that is and he's fully initiated into his family's heritage and because the whole fam the whole village by the way they like worship this family right so he's a bloodline elite and he gets his head cut off and so he ends up being the sacrifice and they float his head out there or his body out there and they put his head in this what they call a tupelec and i forgot to look and see if that's a real thing or a made up thing uh, but it looks like some sort of folk magic. There you go. That's what a Tupelec is. Tupelec Shakur. <laughs> well, how did I get... No, Google. I don't want Tupac. I want Tupelec. And maybe I spell it wrong. Maybe it has a K. I don't know. I don't know if that's real or not. Tupelo. Tupliac. Kubiak. <laughs> We're throwing out obscure references here, right? Nobody under 40, 35 gets those references because we're talking Parker Lewis can't lose tonight. Anyway, y'all feel me. I don't, know, we, I don't know how we fluctuated from 350 to 500 people. So was there something about this that just literally just drove 150 people away? There's 150 people who are just like, no. If he's going to talk about sacrifice, I'm out of here. Next up, y'all, a fun one. And you know I was going to do it, Cabin in the Woods. Now, we've not done Cabin in the Woods. Can you believe it? And you would think we would have because Cabin in the Woods is totally up the alley of what we talk about over here. And Cabin in the Woods is... A satire of horror, obviously. Joss Whedon does intent, uh, pretty consistently, actually, include conspiratorial themes in a lot of his screenplays. And we saw this when Jamie and I did our Buffy analysis, which, by the way, is a great podcast if you've not seen our Buffy analysis. We went pretty deep on it. And there's a lot more going on in Buffy the Vampire Slayer than you would expect, believe it or not. And that was uh, Joss Whedon getting his start. I'm not advocating for his politics. Everybody always says, like, oh, you know, he's left. I know that. Do you think I don't know that? It's like immediately when a name comes up, 
the know-it-alls have to tell you everything that you already know. We know that, dude. Come on. We know that. We know that. Oh, y'all haven't seen Cabin in the Woods? What what the heck? What's going on with y'all? What's going on with y'all? Now, I do have a good analysis of this, I have to say. So I will refer a little bit to my my analysis. By the way, uh, welcome everybody. If you would hit like and share. We're having fun tonight as we delve deep into Lovecraft themed movies. Our next one is Cabin in the Woods, a 2011 Joss Whedon film. But I'll give you a little bit of a, a image here. You can see what's going on. So basically, we have the college archetypes, right? This is this is the archetypes of the people in a horror movie who go into the horror narrative willingly. And this is tongue in cheek because the characters are pretty much knowingly and explaining themselves as horror archetypes right and we've seen this before this is nothing new you couldn't have cabin in the woods without scream right shout out to uh, randy meeks so basically we're doing a little bit of randy meeks tonight we're playing the part of randy meeks y'all know who randy meeks is right that's jamie kennedy and if you've not surely you've seen randy meeks right because Randy explains horror to you and how to survive horror scenes, right? And by the way, we will be doing a comedy show in Hollywood. Get your tickets now if you're not there. Jamie is the headliner, Jamie Kennedy, as in Randy Meeks, Scream, Jamie Kennedy. There's the tickets right there. You can't beat that. But do you remember the scene where he explains you to you the horror Archetypes. You couldn't have Cabin in the Woods without this. She never showed her tits, so she went with jits. Could afford a decent pair. Would you? Here's Randy explaining the horror tropes. Right now, this is 1996. There are certain rules. That one wants to buy by in order to buy a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. There you go. There's the link. You can go watch that. Uh, Randy Meeks and Scream. Giving you the tropes and the rules. And we have a play on this in Cabin in the Woods where we have the rules, the lessons, the archetypes, the patterns. But this one gets even crazier because it's not the conspiracy that you think it is. It starts with the idea that we uh, just have teens or excuse me, uh, freshman, you know, sophomore college kids being messed with. So we think, oh, there's a giant government conspiracy because we initially see government workers in the underground base. And they basically have an underground NSA facility that is spying on, surveilling, harassing, mind controlling, uh, drugging these people without their knowledge by design, but we don't know why. But you'll notice that it is a, an occult government, which is interesting because you don't you don't know what's going on. You just see well, there's these nonchalant sort of psychopathic government workers, and they seem to be arranging and surveilling these poor college kids. What the heck is going on, right? It's a totally synthetic environment. We find out. And we have immediately the notions of panopticism. Everything is surveilled. Everything is watched and controlled. And it's even intentionally using the horror archetypes and tropes. Now, the Fran Kranz guy, who is the stoner guy, 
It's interesting because he is the archetype of the fool. If you don't know your archetypes, the fool archetype is the character, the com the comedian, the fool comedian archetype. He's able to speak the truth. He's able to in the art in in symbology, be the character that says as a kind of a Cassandra, right? What's true and no one listens to him. So there's the Cassandra prophecy curse that you can know all the mysteries and know the truth, but nobody, nobody listens. And so Fran Kranz, the uh, humorous stoner guy, who is the archetype of the stoner character, which is kind of funny because he violates the rules of horror that Randy Meeks sets out because you can't drink and smoke and engage in, uh, co the, you can't catch the coitus in horror movies because you're gone. Because if you remember, horror movies operate on the kind of quasi-Christian idea that if you commit the vices, you are opening the gateway. You're making a pact in a way with evil. You're opening those doors. Uh, and so it's kind of ironic that the stoner character in this film is the one who begins to notice things. And the first thing that we notice that's odd is that when they're on their way to the event, or excuse me, to the cabin in the woods, the stoner character, Fran Cran, says, have you guys noticed that cell phones are everywhere? It's almost like they're tracking and tracing us. And he says, eventually they're going to start putting these things in our heads. So he immediately throws out the micro chip in the head and you're like hey wait a minute what the heck yes he says this he says that they're going to put it in kids heads even and track the kids and everybody says oh you're just the dumb stoner right you're just the stoner conspiracy man oh twin twin full hat man nah dude they're doing it then we get the puppet masters speech and that one's interesting because as he starts to notice what's going on that's weird in this weekend as things get bizarre people start acting strange just because they're drugged and the girl's drug the the preppy chick is drugged by her hair dye so the deep state dyed her hair dye <laughs> or excuse me uh poisoned her hair dye and they put pheromones in it to make her go nuts and he's over there watching this he notices these patterns and he says you know have you, have you are you guys not noticing all these patterns he's a pattern he's a noticer and then he says, it's almost like there's puppeteers that are watching us, controlling us, causing us to do things. And they're like, ah, you're just too stoned. You've been smoking too much. It's your paranoia. But it turns out he's correct. Things get weirder and they get weirder. And the crew, it's the weird part though is it's not voluntary. It's, it's, the environment is controlled to lead them into their voluntary acceptance of pact with evil. And they choose the redneck zombie <laughs> narrative, unfortunately, accidentally. And they let loose these hordes of entities. And here's all the uh, NSA deep state underground operatives cheering because they have uh, fantasy football style bets on who will do what and, and how they will die. Well, it turns out that this is all a pact that humankind has made through the elites with the old ones. The old ones are the giant titans of old who live somewhere in the hollow earth and they require human sacrifice. They require the blood of humans to keep them chill. They are a kind of satanic elite then, embodied in the figure of the humans, in the figure at the end of uh, Sigourney Weaver. So Sigourney Weaver plays the essentially the satanic elite that runs the shadow government, which has made a deal with the Anunnaki, the giants, who inhabit the lower parts of the earth, that they will not destroy the earth if they get human sacrifices but the human sacrifices have to be of a certain type and of certain virtues 
And so the you know redheaded girl is supposed to be the virgin. It turns out she's not because again this is a this is kind of a comedy, right? And uh, it turns out else I'm I'm assuming everybody's seen it, right? That it's the Book of Enoch. How's the Book of Enoch? Well, in the Book of Enoch, when the giants are on the earth and they start demanding human sacrifice right they it, this is primarily why they're punished right these offspring because they demand human sacrifice and the worship of humans and this becomes a rival to the worship of the true god and this is what according to the account of the book of enoch and jude brings the flood god floods the world because these titans are running things and they're just too, they're just bad news, and so it turns out that the satanic elite have had to make this pact so that Earth doesn't get destroyed. And so it's just interesting that it seems in the Lovecraft inspired horror that we have this notion of blood sacrifice as necessary. The life is in the blood, Leviticus says, and this, of course, in the Orthodox view, is why the Eucharist is really the fulfillment. In the truest sense of this, I'm not saying that human sacrifice was ever good or ever could help you or, or, or aid you. It's a, a demonic practice. But the fundamental idea of there being power and uncreated life, immortality in the blood, is the meaning of both Leviticus, the Mosaic Covenant, the animal sacrifices. What That's what their purpose was, to point to the fulfillment and the end of that in Christ. Now, even the sacrifice of Abraham, right? That when Abraham offers Isaac, the point of that story is actually against human sacrifice because God says that it, the point of the text is that that's not the kind of sacrifice that God requires. And it's not the case that there's some sort of infinite debt payment that God had to kill his son to pay a debt that he owed to himself, right? That's not, that's a Protestant view of this. It's not the Orthodox view. Anyway, so you get the idea, right? It's basically the book of Enoch and the giants of many human sacrifices applied to film. And that is actually what the book of Enoch says, if you didn't know that. So if you read the whole text, it says that they were roaming the earth and uh, requiring human sacrifice. And to me, this makes sense because in at least three places in the Deuterocanon, it references the Titans as actual giants. So if we do believe in the Deuterocanon, if it's part of our canon of scripture, which it is, then that's the way that we ought to interpret Genesis 6, not as symbols of powerful people. I do think that the powerful men of old were, you know, somebody like, Hercules, that actually sounds, by the way, like the story of Samson, if you ask me. But, you know, if there was a, a figure that was, a you know, a Nimrod, right? Nimrod was a powerful man who wanted to be worshipped as God. Sure, yeah, but there's also the story of the Titans and the story of the giants. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there's not truth to that. That the biblical story of giants, if it's not been covered up, maybe even in archaeology. I, I mean, I don't have any proof of this, but I've wondered, like, what if the Smithsonian's job is to just cover up biblical archaeology? Right? Wouldn't that be wild? I could see that being the case, basically, right? <laughs> All right, let's move on to our next one, which was uh, not that good of a movie. But it did, ha it did have some interesting elements. <clears throat> and it's probably one of the first Dean Stockwell films. The Dunwich Horror, which is a Lovecraft story. By the way, thank you guys. I'll read a couple super chats here in a second. We should go ahead and read some because we've gotten a good ways into tonight's foray into Lovecraft. Lovecraft. We got super chats out the wazoo from... Well, I missed, so somebody uh, sent one while I was gone. Not an expert, 
I like that humility in that name. Since three dollars, he says, "Thank you, Jay. You helped me towards orthodoxy. That's great to hear." Uh, I see how much of the world is fake and gray. Well, that's good. That's exactly, definitely part of the process, right, uh, is seeing that the world is fake and gray. So hopefully you have found an Orthodox church, by the way. Uh, find a canonical Orthodox church, such as Rokor, Serbian, Antiochian, if you're looking for a church. Co Costco Law School, $3. Jay, a friend of mine asked where the theory is that the Illuminate Confirm requires them to inform their victims of what they are doing. So, I don't know if any occult writers actually say this, but it's kind of like in Cabin in the Woods. The theme of that movie is that if you are willing to do this, this actually may be charged, maybe charged, maybe you're you're willfully going along with this and so all of your uh energy is put into this and that's different than if it was just in other words it's a greater sacrifice it's more evil even because you've convinced the person you haven't just tricked them you've convinced them to be evil and that's kind of the point of cabin in the woods because if you remember all of the creatures from horror movies are demons that are housed in underneath in the underground base and they're let loose when they're needed you see for the human sacrifice Does that makes sense because the titans and the demons work together is the story but that's a great question and the answer is that would be my my guess but i don't actually know that if there's any place where anybody specifically says this somebody said you said that the are there karmic implications from this i didn't know the answer well i don't believe in karma so but people that have this worldview might believe that it makes the sacrifice more powerful would be my guess Adam1912 since 20 bucks. Hey, thank you, Adam1912. I don't recognize that name. It seems like a, a new name. Uh, glad to have you over here. Our longtime super chatter and supporter, J Mel, since $40. Do you speed read? No. In fact, I am a very slow reader. So a lot of people assume that I'm speed reading through all these books. No, it takes me uh, a long time and I, I read really slow. But the advantage of that is that I do retain a lot of the information. So that's the positive side to it. How do you consume so many books? Uh, I just always have books with me at all times, right? I'm always reading, always engaged in working through usually multiple books at once, right? So I think right now I have seven or eight books that I'm trying to work through right now. So, you know, trying to finish up the Patrick Wood, Anthony Sutton book uh, so we can move on to some other books, right? So, but unfortunately, I don't have any great methods to tell you guys or secrets or life hacks. You just have to do it all the time. So that would be my suggestion to just get more discipline and, and, and get to where you feel uh, the way, like if I don't have a book and a pen, like I, I feel like I need those things in my hand. So they kind of become second nature. DC Customs, $5. No question. I just love the content. Best to you and Jamie. Hey, thank you, DC Customs. Long time supporter and super chatter. Harry, $10. Have you seen and do you plan on doing the new film nefarious i knew we'd get a question about this so yes we did see this we got invited to uh, spend the weekend with uh dr bo branson who you've seen on my channel and uh a lot of people at the uh, antiochian uh church up there we had a good time with all of them uh father daniel was a great guy i got to meet him and uh, all of his sons and it was a blast and we actually all went to go see nefarious so I'll give you a quick just statement. <laughs> it's like a issuing a step press conference. What's your statement? <laughs> My statement on nefarious uh, positives. It's good to see uh, Christian movies stepping it up a little bit. And this one is, you know, if you, if you seen a lot, a lot of Christian movies are just corny and they're no good. They're just poorly produced and they're just, they're just corny. So this one was a little better than that. And that's good. And it, it had some good insights. It's a very, 
it's very much like C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. So you can tell screw tape letters was an influence on this. You could tell maybe even some of these John Carpenter movies were an influence on it. So uh, it had some pros. It was basically like a decent Christian independent movie. Does that make sense? Like the equivalent of an independent horror movie, but kind of like a, a Christian version. And of course, Glenn Beck, basically, you know, he's in the movie. So there was elements of it that I really liked. I thought it was insightful. Uh, my criticism is that it's a little, it was a little over the top. The, the acting of, on the part of the serial killer uh, was, if he had dialed down the possessed character and the normal guy, if he just dialed them both back a little bit, it would have been a little better. And the main guy basically looks like a cross between Joel Osteen and Tom Cruise. So Joel Krustein, I mean, I don't know, something about that guy's face was just kind of annoying to look at for a lot. Because a lot of the movie is the prison back and forth conversation. Basically, 75% of the movie is the prison discourse with the psychiatrist. And I, I would have liked to have seen more than just this discourse. Um... And there was a couple other things that didn't really make sense in the in the in the movie, <laughs> like before you leave here today, you're going to commit three murders. And it's like the first one is uh, you had your mom euthanized years ago. Okay, but you said that I would commit a murder today, and that was something that happened a long time. It just didn't make sense. It's like anyway, but <laughs> but uh, it's not terrible. Okay, so I don't know. What do I give it? out of 10 uh, I give it 6 out of 10 white goatees right 6 out of 10 uh, Colonel Sanders goatees that Glenn Beck has so how, how's that is that, is that okay uh, but it, it's, it's good to see you know Christian films kind of uh, Christian films stepping it up a little bit not being as you know, not be in straight pure flicks. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. Joseph, $10. There's a really good video game based on Lovecraft's cosmic horror called Bloodborne. I played Bloodborne. Um, it's fun. Uh, plot is simple. There's a few interesting themes. Yes. Thank you for that, Joseph. Um, uh, it was okay. It was, it was enjoyable. Uh, Kevin Farrell, $5. I don't think I beat it. I got pretty far in it, but I don't think I beat it. Kevin Farrell says uh, nothing for five. Well, you don't have to say anything, Kevin, but I appreciate it. We still love you. Joshua 40, 50. Uh, which one are you? Are you 40, are you 50, are you 90, 100? What are you at, man? When are you going to do a review of Five Nights at Freddy's? Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, I don't know this movie. It's supposed to have Matthew Lillard in it. Oh, okay, so we're getting some scream people. Scream for me, Kennedy. Scream for me, Jamie. Um, five Nights at Freddy's. Well, I have to see what that is. I don't know what it is. But uh, if we got Matthew Lillard, Lillard, okay, that sounds fun. He was. Do you remember him uh, popping up in? He popped up in uh, Twin Peaks season two. Remember that. He was he was good in that by the way that was that was a good uh, cameo there. So Five Nights at Freddy's is looks like it's going to be some kind of a Willy's Wonderland. Remember that that was fun with uh, Nick Cage. I enjoyed that one and that one had a occult serial killer possession theme. That kind of looks like what we got here maybe. Um, I don't want to ding the you know what so. I'll skip ahead a little bit. So, yeah, this looks... There's Matthew Lillard. The kids are getting... Sinking into the... This is basically Willy's Wonderland. To me. So, yeah, we'll definitely check it out. But it looks like Willy's Wonderland. Did you guys like Willy's Wonderland? See, we just jumped from like 350 to 450. I don't know what's going on with these numbers. What's up? Thank you guys for those super chats. Much appreciated. Uh, making it worth it tonight. 
Made me work it. Watch me work it. I put the movies down, flip it, and reverse it. All right, that was really stupid, but I couldn't re resist it. Y'all want me to drop these movies rather than put my thing down, flip it, and reverse it. Y'all don't want me to put no things down and flip them and reverse them. What does that even mean? Body parts? Yo, could you flip that and then also put it down and then reverse it? Can't reverse body parts. What the heck are you talking about? Um, let's see. If you would hit like and share. And also we have live events coming up. If you guys want to come see us doing our live event in uh, Hollywood, get your tickets now. People need to go ahead and get on these tickets. Get get it right there. Jamie Kennedy, me and Jamie live in LA. Now we got a bunch of friend people that like our stuff out in LA. Why aren't y'all buying the tickets? Where are you at? Get your tickets right there. July 6th. Five hours. It's a party, dude. And have you not watched the Jamie Kennedy experience? It's like the most genius comedy show ever. You haven't even watched. You don't want to come say hi to Jamie Kennedy? What's wrong with y'all? And me and Jamie? And y'all? What, what, what's the problem here? I forgot to read my... I'll give you guys this. We don't have time to read all this. If you want to read my Cabin in the Woods analysis, I'll put it in the chat there. You can go read that later. I'm not going to sit here and read to y'all, you know, lazies. Will you read to me? I don't want to read. Will you read to me? You need to read, lazy. Get up. Done which horror. That's where we're at. We got to get to this Yog Sukoth. Yog Sothoth. It's about to get crazy in here. I, did, I had a scary dream one time when this these Cthulhuic deities were in my dream. It was pretty creepy, I have to say. 1970, Dunwich Horror. This is a B-movie. It's not very good, but it was fun. And uh, it's got to be one of the first Dean Stockwell movies. And there was rumors. I mean, I'm not saying this is true. I just People have said, oh, Dean Stockwell actually is into the occult. I don't know if that's true. But uh, I read that in a book somewhere. But we're back to... Um, you know, sacrificing broads on the altar. I mean, this is straight up pure uh, demonic cult. And Dean Stockwell wants uh, to check out the Necronomicon from, from a, basically an academic library. Now, why do you have the real Necronomicon just kind of sitting out to be checked out in the library, first of all? I mean, if it's the real Necronomicon, people, people are going to know it, right? And it's just kind of over there on a glass case. I mean, this thing would be worth a zillion dollars. Basically, you got the book that can end the world. And it's not even under any kind of alarm system. It's just sitting there to be checked out. I'm a lizard? What does that mean? Yes. Yes, I'm a lizard person. Good job, dude. So he wants to check out the Necronomicon from the library he puts a little bit of a love spell on the blonde gal uh, librarian and she's like oh but he looks so good and it's like really Dean Stockwell you know it's magic if he's spitting game as Dean Stockwell because he don't look that good he just looks like a normal dude and she's like, oh but he looks so good he can check it out <laughs> so he checks out the Necronomicon right and we find out that he is the great grandson of some hanged infamous person and basically checking out the necronomicon it's an occult bible that will invoke the entities right so he is engaging in his dark arts you go to his estate it's a giant occult ritual estate with you know sigils all over the floor the tiles i mean it just looks crazy right and the idea here is that these rituals will open the portals to the other things, to the old ones. So he seduces the blonde, traps her at his house, mind controls her, drugs her, and essentially puts her into, we don't, it's un, it's unclear exactly what is real and what's not. Uh, but he, they put her through this ritual, essentially, and she's drugged. So we got Rosemary's baby elements here because this is basically... This is basically a B version of Rosemary's Baby in a lot of ways. 
There is a weird part too where they actually have liturgical fans in this ritual. That was the weird one of the weirdest things. So this is the artistic way of describing a, an SCX ritual. You got it. Now he's doing that curly pose. And that makes me think, oh no, maybe actually Dean Stockwell really was into uh, Crowley stuff because here he's doing that Crowley pose. So that is, you know, famous pose there where you're, you're like putting, giving yourself the, you know, horns or whatever, and it's two pillars and that to me suggests that you know that's what dean stockwell is envisioning in this movie what he's trying to portray because and there, there you see there's the estate right where they got the they're basically torgo right they got an old torgo running around trying to warn everybody about hanging out at this estate <laughs> the worst part of this movie is that it turns out spoiler alert that it's a brother to Dean Stockwell who lives in the basement or basically the dang broom closet and he is a Cthulhu man I don't know how he's got a Cthulhu brother but he's got a Cthulhu brother with a bunch of tentacles somehow and that's because the parents his mom had the uh, caught the colitis with some sort of sea demon entity <laughs> so so that's the dunwich horror right is that again not only are we in new england with all the incel horror boys up there uh like lovecraft and dean coombs but we're also up there with dean stockwell and his weirdo brother who's basically uh who's the guy in Pir pirates of the caribbean <laughs> That's his, that's his brother, right? Y'all know what I'm talking. You've seen, have you seen Pirates of the Caribbean? Nobody's seen that movie either. Nobody's seen Pirates of the Caribbean. Anyway, so basically, that's his brother, and that's because their daddy, the real daddy, wasn't the milkman. It was Dagon, basically. But there are some interesting sequences. Some. You know, his whole body becomes this weird uh, icon. You'll notice the Hebrew letters there, the Kabbalah, all that kind of stuff. Um, that pops up also in the Tom Coom mo Mummy movie. <laughs> Coomy. <laughs> Mummy with Tom Coom, which was a terrible movie. But the goddess, remember her body was all uh, inscribed. And so basically the, the body becomes a giant book. A living book a living word which is this is an uh, mimic right of scripture and jesus as the logos the bible as the living word etc it's kind of a version of that i think this comes up in color out of space too right which we'll return to that here in a second i'll give a brief overview of that because that was a lot of fun but basically long story short the, the mother lavinia ha uh, had um made love to a entity and dean stockwell and his brother are the offspring of this entity and that's how dean stockwell has his powers and so he knows actually to because he's part uh shall we say anunnaki uh he has the ability to through sex magic you know do some crazy stuff you know do a little bit of earthquaking did the earthquake for you too cthulhu <laughs> did, did the earth move for you too cthulhu uh anyway it's but it's not a very good movie so interesting ideas very rosemary's baby but pretty goofy now there is a fan favorite that we're not going to be covering tonight everybody loves evil dead and army of darkness we are going to, I'll do Evil Dead Rise. There's not a whole lot in it, but it is a Cthulhu, Cthulhonic movie. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll just do, you know, Evil Dead and Army of Darkness some other time. But obviously, that's a very Lovecraftian movie. Sam Raimi's classic movies. Um, yeah, this is Genesis 6, Nephilim stuff going on. Now, 
there is color magic, which is interesting, that pops up in this movie. Um, Dean Stockwell does engage in quite a bit of color magic. And I'm wondering to what degree Lovecraft studied or was interested in those topics. Again, you'll see there's the giant sigil of this cult there on the ground. Uh, of course, those are all made up in this movie, but the here's the weird part. <laughs> If you go and read uh, the summary of the actual story, it'll tell you more about the background of the Necronomicon at the library, which you can just check it out, by the way. What's the late fee, by the way, when if you don't bring back the... I mean, you just put a curse on the library, and, you know, so you can get around those late fees. Here's the weird part. The cosmic entity, Yog sothoth which is first mentioned in Lovecraft's story, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, the being that is said to take the form of a conglomeration of glowing spheres. So it's almost a sort of uh, entity like the spheres of the Kabbalah, you see. And there's a later connection, right, between this in mathematics. This You'll see what I mean. Watch this. This is an all-knowing deity. Now, in my view, this might be uh, because Lovecraft was not a fan of anything to do with the Hebrew Bible or anything to do with that. The fact you catch what I mean, uh, especially as he became an uh, atheist incel man of his day. So this all-knowing deity who appears as Hebrew spheres... <laughs> Is this the biblical uh, Old Testament God? You see, this is Yahweh, I think. So is Yahweh supposed to be perhaps Yog Sothoth, what he calls a demon? Uh, this demon is also co coterminous with all time and space, but is also locked out of the universe that we inhabit. So this would be like a Gnostic portrayal of how the, you know, how, how they see uh, Jehovah. This is hinted at in a passage from Through the Gates of the Silver Key by Lovecraft. And this is wild because here we're getting into some weird philosophical stuff. But Lovecraft says, all in one and one in all, limitless being and self. So here you have the one and the many question. Uh, infinity in the one and the one is also infinite. It's also uh, the question of the one and the many, philosophically speaking, and limitless being in the self, not merely a thing of one space-time or continuum, but allied in all ultimate animating essence of existence, the unbounded sweep, the last utter sweep, which has no confines and which reaches, outreaches fancy and mathematics alike. So this is beyond, right? God is beyond being, but also... Uh, in being, so to speak, via his energies. It was perhaps that which certain secret cults of earth worshipped as Yog Sothoth. So these are the names that he made up for these different things, right? Kenneth Grant, the uh, Crowleyan, Typhonian guy that wrote about a bunch of occult stuff, right? He suggested that the description of Yog Sothoth is a conglomeration of malignant globes from the spheres of the Clefot of the Kabbalah. This deity has uh, other names. That which the crustaceans of Yogoth worship as the beyond one. Uh, so this is the Aperon, which in, in Greek theology or philosophy might be also referencing God, right? Um, is God's essence is beyond being. Apophatic theology. And which the vaporous brains of the spiral nebulae know as the untranslatable sign, right? So God who, the one who cannot be named, right? So Tetragrammaton, perhaps. Um, then it goes on to say that this deity sees all and knows all, so it has omniscience. To please this deity would, however, bring you knowledge of many things. And uh, it requires, according to some human sacrifice so there might also be a connection to Kronos with this Yog Sothoth according to Lovecraft's letters and by the way do you know he wrote the sec he was the second most prolific letter writer after Voltaire Yog Sothoth is the offspring of the nameless mists born out of the deity of Azathoth so where does he get this 
This deity mated with Shub Niggeroth, which is this thing. Okay, we're talking about literal flying spaghetti monsters now, right? <laughs> Look at these. <laughs> I mean, it actually looks like um, spaghetti. I mean, that's that is this is what this is the deity that Richard Dawkins worships. Right. You thought Richard Dawkins was making fun of Christianity when he talked about flying spaghetti monster. No, he's actually a worshiper of the uh, ancient rites of Azathoth and Dagon and uh, Yog Sothoth. So there you go. Azathoth is the hideous name. Combine the biblical name of Anathoth, where Jeremiah was from, and Azazel to make Anathoth. The alchemical term Azoth is used in the ritual magic writings of A.E. Waite, and he was the model wizard for the thing on the doorstep. So here we do have a, a direct reference to ritual magic through A.E. Waite and uh, Lovecraft. So there is some degree, and then here you get all these weird names that you're supposed to like, you chant these and it summons them, all this silly stuff, right? Uh, fungi from Yugoth. And there's there's a lot of sighting of chaos here. So maybe Jordan Peterson. No! Do you believe in Yog Sothoth? Well, I know a lot about it, but do you know about it? Do you believe in the rights of Dagon? And chaos. A lot of a lot of chaos. Anyway, he does. There, there does seem to be some um, out of the aeons, right? Lovecraft defined Shubnagoroth as the mother goddess, the mound, the all mother. So here's the goddess. This is the same as Astart, and in the in the work out of the aeons, she is described as one of the deities. Uh, a siding with humanity against evil gods so there you go <laughs> her first mention is in the Dunwich, Hor the Dunwich Horror where I quote from the Necronomicons Necronomicon discussing the old one breaks into the exclamation of this entity anyway so there you go curious references there Father Dagon. So, the esoteric connections to Dunwich Horror are much more interesting than the actual movie, The Dunwich Horror, which is, again, not very good. So, but if you're looking for a fun B movie, uh, the next few are not going to be too difficult. Hopefully, we can get through these pretty quick. Now, Here's what was interesting was that when I watched this uh, Bella movie here, I thought I'm going to get a uh, short haired, you know, Susan Powder, uh, you know, underwater vampire lesbians, right? That's what you think when, you, when you're looking at this, right? With Kristen Stewart. No. This is Cthulhu. What? Yes. Uh, it was okay. It was an entertaining movie. I wouldn't say it's good, but the most interesting part was that I didn't know that I was watching a Cthulhu movie. So I actually enjoyed the fact that I had no idea. And now I've ruined it for you. The key, most interesting element of this movie, I have completely ruined for you. So they're studying the Mariana Trench. So they're basically, you know, a bunch of, they're basically like James Cameron. He's sending Bella down there. There's no sparkly Robert Pattinson's, I'm sorry, if that's what you wanted. Into the Abyss. Now, I like this because the Abyss is tied to the biblical Abyss, right? Stop the insanity. People don't know who's... There's like two people in the chat that know who Susan Powder is. Is it Power or Power? Powder. Remember Stop the Insanity? Powder. It is, dude. Kristen Stewart was like, I'm done being a vampire. I want to, to look like Susan. Pa so 
stop the insanity. I remember the 90s, dude. If you, so in the 90s, this is one of those omnipresent infomercials. There's like a handful of these from the 90s, right? I mean, there's a bunch of 90s infomercials, but some of them just kind of have like enshrined themselves in everyone's psyche, unfortunately. And Susan Powder is one of them. Stop the insanity. To taking back her life and becoming lean, strong, and healthy. Thousands have heard her message, and now you can too. It's time to take control. It's time to stop the insanity. So, anybody falling asleep on the couch in 1993, you wake up at 1 in the morning, and this is what you see. I mean, she's more excited than freaking Bill Gates at a Microsoft conference. You guys ready to stop the insanity? She looked like Katy Perry, too, didn't she? Remember when Katy Perry looked just like that? to be skinny it's waking up every day hating the way you look and feel it's beating the heck out of ourselves all the time because anyway i concur stop the insanity stop the cthulonic insanity is what bella is over here saying she's gonna do it anyway long story short they cross the abyss and as they get deeper and deeper into the abyss things get worse We think that we're just plagued by these sort of shrimp men. These weird shrimp creatures. No. It's actually a gigantic Cthulhu. And uh, we get... By the way, there's a weird Baphomet pentagram in this movie that just pops up on a map out of nowhere. So that that was the one interesting... I mean, it's like literally like a weird inverted pentagram on a map. It makes no sense, but it's there. Um, don't know why it doesn't really fit the narrative. It's like a TJ Kirk. Is that him? Is that the amazing atheist TJ? What's his name? He's in this. So this is basically just aliens underwater. And then it turns out that it's Cthulhu. Anyway, so there you go. I just uh, spoiled that whole, whole movie for you. Uh, but you know what you're getting. That's what it is. Going back and watching color out of space was enjoyable this is a 1927 lovecraft story and it was okay the actual story was was okay i didn't really care for dagon was not that interesting um i do know this story as well and arkham arkham is an old town full of witches legends and evil we find out that there is a druid lady by the lake uh, in this movie, this is Nick Cage's daughter, right? She's in Drew Lee. This is Jamie's notes. Nick Cage's daughter is into Wicca, which is interesting because the this film adds into the story the the witchcraft element, the Wicca element, right? And I like this idea, kind of like uh, you know Stranger Things, where she doesn't actually understand that she does invoke this entity, right? So the, the daughter and doing her Wiccan rituals seems to be actually calling down this entity. And we later find out that she has the Necronomicon, the fake Necronomicon that I'm talking about, right? The Simon Necronomicon, which is not real. And she has Crowley's Book of the Law in her bedroom. That is weird. Because, of course, that's not mentioned in the actual story, but it's intentionally put into the movie. And so here she is riding out there, and and there's a lot of... This is very visually well done. I think it's the same people that did Pano Cosmatos's Beyond the Black Rainbow. I think they produced this. And it's the same people that did Mandy. Uh, it's pretty gross. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. There's a lot of John Carpenter goo creatures. There's basically a giant ball of uh, nougat and alpaca and goo. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty gross. 
uh, and humans begin to meld together. Basically, we have the undoing of the cosmos. Basically, the metaphysical structure of the world itself is beginning to unravel. And I actually like this element a little bit. This was interesting. I like this in a horror movie because it's not something we usually see in horror movies. You know, it's it's what if there's a, a thing that's just a color from space that's that's invoked and it's just making the metaphysical structure of everything just kind of go ape shit. That's what this movie is. And you get your fill of Crage. There is no shortage of Crage, Crage Rage. And he goes completely insane. Um, so I've already done a whole breakdown of this movie, so I'm not going to redo all of that. You can go watch my uh, analysis. I will give you the link to that right here. If you want my color out of space, full breakdown. Back when I was, I don't know what I was thinking, sitting down at the bottom of the screen, wearing a stupid hat. I don't know, but I wasn't putting a whole lot of thought into aesthetics back then. We've definitely... Look at that. We've definitely upped the aesthetics, right? Get that stupid hat off. Didn't even know it was a girl's hat. Ooh, I just self-owned. Self-owned. It was on the rack with all the other hats. What am I supposed to do? It ain't my fault. Dang. I'll just never wear a hat again. Thank you guys for those super chats. Appreciate those. All right, where are we at? Evil Dead Rise. If you want to watch the full analysis where I get into the esoteric elements, but I did enjoy Color Out of Space. Mandy, uh, Mandy's not Lovecraft, but you know this is when Nick Cage was starting to like make a kind of a comeback, and you know we were we were happy for that. We were we were here aiding and cheering that on, helping as best we could. And by the way, unbearable. Uh, lightness of being no, the uh unbearable weight of massive talent is also really good so nick cage has had he's had a streak of really good movies in the last five years i would say um mandy is a better movie than colorado space but for an independent you know weird horror movie i, I did enjoy color but it is gross it's a yuck movie jamie and i had decided i had forgotten how gross it was but um, it does capture the uh, disturbing grossness of a Lovecraft horror story. Last one I'm going to do is Evil Dead Rise. This was not the movie I expected. I, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, Evil Dead movies are pretty, pretty intense. If you watch the series with uh, Bruce Campbell. I mean, I grew up with this movie. I used to have the poster, had the VHS. I, I just, for whatever reason, I really liked Evil Dead and Army of Darkness growing up. And that was where I first heard of the Necronomicon before I checked it out for my university library. Uh, in Evil Dead Rise, we have some interesting elements I didn't expect. We have the... Should, should I pull it up? No, we don't need that. We've been going for a pretty good while. It's getting kind of late. Did you notice the beginning when we find the teens at the cabin in the woods and it looks as if it's the cabin from, uh, right, Ash's cabin, I assume. She's reading Wuthering Heights and she's saying the phrase, let me in. And a lot of people forget that Wuthering Heights is like basically a kind of a possession story, right? Emily Bronte, right? Wuthering, is it? No, does she write... I read this actually in my film and lit class and it was better than I expected it to be. And the old movie is also okay. Uh, it has Olivia de Havilland in it, right? That's right. Ooh, wait a minute. So Kate Bush, has a song. I'd be interested to hear what her song is. 1939. Well, I didn't realize it was that old. Uh, but yes. So this, if you've never seen, this is, by the way, it has nothing to do with Lovecraft. But I was talking to Jamie about this and she didn't know that this is like basically a possession movie because the entity or Heathcliff, right? 
he basically it's like let me in let me in and then it, you have the consciousness stepping in to another being because one person is so into another person but it's almost it's like but wait is it that or is it a possession movie right uh yeah Heathcliff and I forget her name but this is a pretty good old movie if you're looking for a good old movie but it's a possession movie so we already have this hint at the beginning that we know this is going to be about demonic possession then we fast forward to uh, the present day after uh, the girls and guys at the cabin are basically all demolished via this demonic entity one of the evil dead and we are at an apartment building where it's kind of nods to Ghostbusters, right? Where you've, we've got um, a single mom who now has lost her masculine authority in the household. And you'll notice a lot of horror movies that you, you, we see this element where there's a single parent. And particularly where this, the spiritual father is missing, there's now an open doorway for the demonic to enter. And that's what happens here. You actually get the, uh, I don't think it's intentionally saying that because it's, it's, it's trying to have like a feminist message, but ironically in an indirect way, it doesn't have a feminist message because all hell breaks loose. Now that she and the husband have parted ways. And I think it's something like, you know, she says he cheated or something like that. And then her sister, who's a rocker and also a feminist comes to console her because she's now a, a single mom to, I think three kids. And uh, with no spiritual father in the house, the gates to all Hades have been opened loose. And what I did appreciate about this movie, and it's also gross, I'm going to warn you, this is a gross, you know, yucky horror movie. I mean, this is actually what I think demons would be like. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, this is more of a demonic portrayal of how evil and manipulative a demon actually and malicious a demon actually would be as opposed to a lot of goofy Hollywood portrayals because in this the demons are actually very smart very clever now I mean they have like too much power right obviously this is way over the top but you have that old theme of how the demon is basically eventually kicked out of the house when the mom gets fully possessed and they keep trying to deny that she's possessed, even though they can't. It gets to a certain point where it's basically undeniable. They somehow boot her out of the apartment, and she keeps wanting to get back in. And this is a classic horror mythology trope of you have to willfully invite and let these things in, right? Yeah, the cheese grater thing, that was the worst part. Uh, there was two or three times I had to do this, right? This is pretty gross. But... Oh, I forgot to mention the whole building is haunted. And it, that's because this was a bank. And uh, it it was, uh, at one point, I think, was it related to, it somehow connected? It's like a church. It became a bank or something. And they had to bring in these priests and do an exorcism because this priest had found an old book, which is the Necronomicon. And the priest thought that for the Vatican, he could uh, transcribe the invocations and then the Roman Catholic Church would know what the the demons were up to now it's interesting that it went from being you know, like church to bank right because that's funny but the Vatican says no uh, you can't translate that which we know that's not true because Francis would be like yes please translate the Necronomicon now we're going to use that in the next Novus Ordo Ecumenist Liturgy um the priest is told no. And so the priest defies the Vatican and says, well, I don't care if I'm excommunicated. I'm going to go ahead and do an audio recording on an LP on a record of the rituals of the Necronomicon. And so good uh, MacGuffin there because you can't, the Necronomicon can't really do anything until you say the magic words. And this is all again, Roman Catholic thinking. Cause it's like, you know, the the priest, no matter what, even if he's a Satanist in the Roman Catholic Church, right, he can still pronounce the magic words and it still, uh, you know, causes the Eucharist to be. That's all 
very mechanical, technological thinking about spirituality from the overly legalistic rigorism of the Roman Catholic Church and its sacramentology. That's in this book, and or excuse me, in this movie. And so we have the son, who, by the way, uh, do you notice the? It's it's hard to it seem to be very non-binary. And the son uh, doesn't know what he's getting into because he's a DJ. And so he thinks he's just found weird old recordings, right, to like mix or whatever. And he starts playing the records, and then we have the invocation of the demons. I forgot to say that. But that's a very, um, it's just a very superstitious attitude towards sacramentology, which is just the opposite of, you know, the orthodox attitude, right? It's not a mechanical, uh, you know, device that you can tap into, like some kind of magic formula. By the way, did you notice too that it's funny that they, they portray the Necronomicon in this as living, so it's actually bound with human flesh. So it has a body, right? It's got skin, it has teeth, and it's alive. So once again, just like if you think about it in Scripture, you have the Lamb's Book of the Life excuse me, the Lamb's Book of Life. There's also mentioned the Book of the Living. We have the mention of Ezekiel eating the book. The Living Book, the Living Word. The Necronomicon is like an inverse of that. It's like a demonically living book or word. And Oh yeah, I forgot we're in Los Angeles. St. Patrick's Cathedral in Los Angeles had the book in 1923. The priest wanted to translate it. They said no. Uh, this leads to the entity being rele released when the, ch the the kid, the DJ, plays the records. The demon possesses the mind first, and then you rot from the inside out in this narrative. And that's why in this, they the possessed can you know do a lot of... They're basically like super villains in this. The plan is, for the entities is that they want to bring total chaos. So we have like full-on, right... Jordan Peterson level stuff here. Total chaos. Well, they're going to bring total chaos. There's a lot of uh, nods to maybe it's like the Ghostbusters, like Ghostbusters with the haunted uh, apartment complex or building, or uh, it's, it's kind of like that Ghostbusters building, right? Um, we have nods to The Shining with the uh, blood in the elevator. There's a blood baptism, which is odd because that's actually one of the ancient mysteries of the mithra is a blood baptism and we see that for whatever reason in this so sort of like christianity really isn't well actually uh it's ambiguous it's sort of like uh in evil dead the christianity it's almost like it's not that it's it doesn't have any power but the characters aren't christian and so maybe you could read it in that way that well if you're not Christian, then you're not, you don't have that protection that you would have. And so these women, again, this is maybe inadvertent, but the, the two sisters, one of whom gets possessed, right? And the other one saves the, 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 the little, one of the kids, she only saves one. Um, it's almost impossible in other words, without, you know, explicit Christian faith. And so basically nothing works against these things except some form of virtue or some form of maintaining that that notion of virtue we get a john carpenter uh, goo person that was neat um but it's very gross so but it is very lovecraft inspired so i'm very interested and in very uh this time around i never thought about the patterns and the connections between living books that was something that uh, piqued my interest this time around and we got more super chats. I'll read those here. Let's see, we got Orthodox Knight, ten dollars. This is Elijah. I hope you enjoyed the visit to my parish. Yeah, we had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Um, I hope it wasn't a bombardment. No, we had a great time talking to everybody there. Uh, I enjoy your esoteric occult streams. Thank you. Uh, of course, not promoting it. We're just pointing out what's in these movies, the symbolism, the imagery. Uh, Gregory Miller. Eighty-two, sixty-four, ten dollars. I live in California, gold country. Did you get it all? Is there some left? I found a Saint Basil of Austro Serbian church that's driving distance from me. Well, that's good. 
Their others are OCA and they're far away. This church, however, has no website. Well, as long as they're a canonical church, that's where I would recommend. So, you know, stay away from like weird schismatic non-canonical groups. LOK thanks by $69, $5. Keep up the good work. I just got married this last week at the Orthodox Church. Hey, that's great to hear. So many people, um, you know, we spent the whole weekend with people that were new to Orthodoxy. Uh, so it's really great to hear that. I'm happy that everybody's coming to the church. That's where you need to be. Uh, let's see. By the way, I want to remind you guys, too, that we have a show sponsor, which is the best in supplements out there. If you head on over to chalk.com, that's C-H-O-Q.com, Get a hold of some of that Irish moss if you're one of those ladies out there that wants to balance their hormones. Uh, Irish moss is great for that. Uh, there's also Action 2.0 if you want to boost your overall energy levels. So we're talking about supplementation for lack of proper nutrient density. Our diets are nutrient deficient. So supplementation can definitely help with that, especially something like Seven Wonders. So if you're looking for overall uh, replacement of nutrient deficiency. This is basically seven of the best mushrooms, not drug mushrooms, but just wholesome, good mushrooms. Daily vitality support. That's a great one. But my favorite, as you guys know, is to boost testosterone, especially for dudes. I've got so many low T dudes everywhere. Uh, and so, like I said, you know, when we're, when you're out in the public, it's starting to look like in the mouth of madness. It's starting to look like, you know, Cthulhuanic entities everywhere. Well, don't be a Cthulhuanic soy entity. Get some Tomcat 100 and beef up your testosterone. And do that by going to choq.com, chalk.com. Excellent, amazing, really cool guys over at chalk.com. They're they're longtime uh, supporter sponsors. Use that promo code. Get that 50% off. And if you use the promo code J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, you get 53% off all recurring subscriptions. And I know that when you get chalk, you're going to want a recurring subscription. So just go ahead and do that. I promise you. Now, if you don't know what to get, there's a stack over there for men. There's a stack over there for women. So you can just use the chalk stacks, see which works best for you, but definitely use chalk.com. Also, you can go to my website and get my giant 660 page book uh, essays on theology and philosophy which is the accidental book that i came out with accidentally that i didn't really do but i did and then there is my, my two esoteric hollywood books go get signed copies of that at the website as well as jamie's books you can get those there too and there is the meta Nefertis book as well get your tickets to our live events as we said uh every post on the website now has a list of all the events if you're looking for our upcoming events just click on one of my posts and you'll see all the upcoming events listed so for example if you go to the website right now click under the events or click under uh click on that and you'll see we've got what's upcoming the live event in nashville rebels for cause you can go get your uh, tickets here at Rebels for Cause. This is a two-day event. She's added new people, by the way. She added, who did uh, Courtney add? Let's see. She added the guy that does the freedom-oriented pop songs. That's a big guy, Jimmy Levy. This guy. So he's going to be performing now. Uh, Owen Harrison. Uh, me and Jamie. Uh, and many other people that you guys have probably heard of. Two-day event in Nashville. Well, Franklin, which is right below Nashville. Really nice area, suburb of Nashville. Uh, fancy town, we could say. Come on down to let me take you to fancy town. Hit like and share, please, if you would. Get your tickets to Rebels for Cause. You can also get the tickets here. Oh, did I already put, yeah, I already put that there. So anyway, she's got a bunch more new uh, people coming. It's going to be two days of hanging out with everybody. It's going to be a blast, right? Um, I think I've come up, by the way, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at this event, but I think I've come up with a good idea. So I think you guys will like it. It's going to be fun. There's that. Uh, what other events? 
Jamie Kennedy event. Get your tickets to that. Oh, I got to sneeze. Also, yes, guys, you can always buy the philosophy course. So just because the this uh, season of tutoring is almost over with all of our tutoring students, you can still buy the philosophy course at any time. It's forever for sale right there at the Autonomy Agora Marketplace over at Richard Grove's Autonomy University. And I want to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Richard Grove over at Tragedy and Hope. Be sure and subscribe also to Scott Mannion, who uh, we did a great interview with as well. He uh, put in some sponsorship support as well. If you go on over to Rockfin right now, you can subscribe not just to me, but to Burmes and to everybody over there. Rockfin is a great platform for a lot of free speech based content, red pill and based content right there. And it's free to sign up for Rockfin. I have a lot of my... Uh, like hundreds of my works videos over there uh but i don't have everything there yet but i will eventually get everything over there so there's pros and cons to either the website or to rockfin you can subscribe to my website as well uh, but the thing about rockfin is that you get access to everybody so for i think 15 dollars, you get everybody's paid content so you get you know seven hour podcasts every week from richard grove covering all the latest news in geopolitics at a level of breakdown that nobody else really does. You get access to me, to and again, all the other people over on Rockfin. So subscribe to Richard, follow him right there, and me as well, and to Burmis and all of our other buddies over there. So uh, what else? I think that's most of what we want to get to today. I don't see any more super chats. Thank you guys for all the support. Hopefully you enjoyed the Lovecraft breakdown. Never done that before. Saw some new movies I'd never seen, some Lovecraft films that I didn't know about, and they were okay. It makes for uh, a better experience talking about the movies with you guys than it does. Some of these talking to you guys is better than than some of these movies. I'll put it that way. <laughs> but it was still fun, and I think next we will be doing. Uh, we got another Tom Coombs stream we're gonna do because I thought, well, we haven't done Edge of Tomorrow. We haven't done, which is Tom Coombe in Space Groundhog Day, Alien Groundhog Day. We haven't done Oblivion. We didn't do Mummy. And so we're going to do another Tom Coombe stream because I forgot he's got so many weird movies too that we could do. And we got a old movie stream coming up. That's going to be fun. Dark, esoteric, noir. I can't decide what I'm going to call it. Dark, occult, noir movie, something like that. Because I finally found some old 40s film noir movies that have a lot of dark themes and symbolism. I didn't think there... I, I was having a hard time finding any. There's a little bit of Fritz Lang, but now we found some. So that's going to be fun. Um, I'd never seen, believe it or not, I'd never seen White Heat. Top of the world, ma! So I finally watched a James Cagney movie. We watched White Heat. It was a lot of fun. That's going to be fun to dissect. We'll do it. We'll do. It. We're going to do a character study. We've not really done that style of analysis yet, so it'll be something new to do. We will do character study of bad guys. We'll do uh, Cagney and White Heat. Top of the world, ma. It's a classic. We're going to do Edward G. Robinson in a couple of his roles because he was a interesting character, and we'll explain why we're doing that. And we've not done a podcast on Sunset Boulevard yet. So we need to do all those. Those are going to be a lot of fun. So that will be one of the upcoming podcasts. And then tomorrow, I will have on with me uh, Brittany Selner, a.k.a. Brittany Pettibone. And we did a chat on her channel a few months ago, and that did well. Got a lot of views on that. Good conversation. So I said, do you want to come on my channel and have a chat? Yeah, sure. So we'll be talking about the uh you know bad news of feminism and all that tomorrow with her and so be on the lookout for that everybody have a good